Hello, I'm Rebecca Robertson, President and Executive Producer of Park Avenue Armory. On behalf of all of us at the Armory, thank you for joining us for this special event, honoring the birthdays of literary giants, Toni Morrison and Audre Lorde, and marking the debut of the Lineage Podcast and Portrait Project's new season. This meditative film entitled, We Hold These Truths, created and curated by conceptual artist Shawnee Jamila, and produced in partnership with the Armory, features some of the foremost socially engaged artists and thought leaders in our nation. We are thrilled to support this series of piercing reflections, honoring the lessons from our elders that ground us and inspire us as we navigate these challenging times. Thank you and enjoy. Hi, I'm Avery Willis Hoffman, Program Director at Park Avenue Armory. During these turbulent times, I'm so pleased we were able to support this collective meditation on the power of our elders' wisdom, created by Shani Jamila, with contributions from a number of our national treasures, artists from many disciplines from across America. We Hold These Truths reminds us to tune into the spirits who ground us, who uplift us. On this day, February 18th, 2021, Audre Lorde would have turned 87 and Toni Morrison 90. Though their bodies no longer walk this earth, their brilliant, prescient, wise words live eternal. When I was five or six, after redlining one of my stories until there was very little black text left, Tony asked me why I was crying. I replied, because I want to be a writer. She looked at me with her signature twinkle and replied, well, you either are a writer or not. There's no wanting to be. A few months after she passed away in 2019, just two weeks before my birthday, she whispered softly in my ear, Avery, you are the writer, the artist, the curator I always knew you to be. Don't forget that, okay? Her words return and sustain me in every challenging moment and with every challenging encounter. And as the years go on, I'm reminded of the state of being the state of wanting to be as she defined it. And I always strive to be the artist, the writer, the curator I'm meant to be, and not to allow a single soul to deter me from maintaining that essential state of being. And so please take a moment to contemplate the wisdoms of your elders and your purpose on this earth for the very short time that you are here and enjoy these inspiring meditations. We hold these truths. Hi, my name is Shani Jamila. As the host and curator of the Lineage Podcast and Portrait Project, as well as the director of this film, we hold these truths. It's my honor to welcome you today. I'd like to begin by saying thank you to our partners at Park Avenue Armory, with a special acknowledgement to Avery Willis Hoffman and Darian Shugs both of whom have devoted countless hours of their deep expertise to the production of this film. I also want to acknowledge our extraordinary team, Alaric Campbell, Becca Meek, Brett Sroka, and Mark Thomas, without whom this film simply couldn't have been made. Today marks exactly one year from when I first began broadcasting Lineage episodes. Lineage is a series of intimate, in-depth conversations with contemporary socially engaged artists from a range of disciplines. It's a fusion of public programming and public art. That's what makes Lineage so unique, this idea of a podcast as art and archive, where we celebrate the influence of both blood ties and cultural genealogies. It was important to me to put this work out into the world on the same day that two of my greatest influences, the writers Toni Morrison and Audre Lorde, were both born. May the stories that we share here honor their remarkable legacies, as well as the legacy of black women elders sung and unsung, who could see us before we were even a thought, who worked towards our well being and who gave their very lives to make sure that we could be. My grandmothers are among those women, and they're the ones who inspire the creation of both my paintings and my podcast. One of them was a genealogist and an educator who rigorously chronicled over 200 years of our family's lineage. My work is made in response to her records. Because they're at the center of this project's origin story, I asked each member of this extraordinary cast to share a truth that they learned from their grandmothers, 
or a grandmother-like figure in their lives. The lessons held and the stories that they so generously shared speak to the significance of our family trees, sending medicine and messages underground through the roots and also encouraging us to look up skyward where we can see the patterns of the branches making room for each other. We make this work very aware of the moment that we find ourselves in. This film is released in the wake of an unprecedented inauguration on the heels of a deeply challenging year of quarantine and loss, in the midst of the dual raging pandemics of racism and virus. And this film is a record of this time. Part of the story is embedded in the imperfections and the glitches and all of the different ways that are so true to this moment that we're living through and how we've committed to make our way to each other in spite of all that seeks to separate us. In the weeks and months to come, I'll air long form interviews with each of the history shaping artists that you'll see here in this film, plus a couple more extremely special guests on the Lineage podcast. Bi-weekly episodes will begin airing on Tuesday, March 2nd, and they'll be available on all podcast platforms as well as on lineagepodcast.com. In the meantime, I encourage you to go back and visit our inaugural season, which features dialogues with some of my New, my New York City neighbors and artists and friends. But today, I invite you to give yourself over to these meditations from our season two guests, who are joining a cohort of some of our nation's most imaginative and inspiring thinkers in sharing stories about ancestry and inheritance, blood and spirit, the stories we share, the silences we keep, and the homes we create for ourselves. Grandma would smile and jokingly say, Tell me who you be. 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 And where you belong.
my first real poem was about you, Mama and Dad. My first real poem recited an alphabet of spit, splattering a white bus driver's face after he tried to push cousin Lucille off a bus and she left Birmingham under the cover of darkness forever. My first real poem was about your child's white arms holding me up against death. My life flows from you, Mama. My style comes from a long line of Louises who picks me up in the night to keep me from wetting the bed. A long line of Sarahs who fed me and my sister and 14 other children from watery soups and beans and a lot of imagination. A long line of Lizzies who made me understand love, sharing, holding a child up to the stars, holding your tribe in a grip of love a long line of black people holding each other up against silence. I still hear your humming, mama. The color of your song calls me home. The color of your words saying, let her be. She got a right to be different. She gonna stumble on herself one of these days. Just let the child be and I be, mama. That's a poem uh, to my grandmother um, mm -hmm. and and on Saturdays, I would be outside playing, running, jumping, getting dirty, you know, braids out, whatever. My aunts complaining about me constantly said she's not acting like a young lady should act. You know, and mama would say, just let her be, just let her be. And I'd run and get behind the couch. And those sisters would start talking about everything. But there was always, as I say in the book, the snapping of the beans. I should never forget that. Between the silences, there was a snapping of the beans. And all of a sudden, one of them said, that you hear uh, Sister Lucille, uh, her husband beating her now, and there was just a snapping of the beans. And one of them said, well, my grandmother said, Mama said, well, um, 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 uh, Gloria, you take uh, uh, her little girl, because you have a little girl of the same age, and, and um, um, Mary, uh, you take uh, the baby because you're still suckling. Your baby's still suckling and she will have something, you know, uh, to eat um, uh, for this day. Um, and then we have to go over there and show her how you put a pot of hot grits on the stove or a pot of hot water on the stove, wake your husband up, hold it over him and say, the next time you hit me, the next time you go to sleep, I will pour this on you. And of course you'll get mad and he'll jump up and leave the house, um, and but he'll come back, you know, an hour later. But he will never hit you again. And yep. they all, they all laughed, you know. And I, you know, I tried to laugh, and Mama would shoot her eyes around the uh, the couch that I had to stop. But I remembered that forever and ever. And I remember when someone uh, 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 hit me once. Right, I looked up and said, you know. No, you'll never do that again because you got to go to sleep and I will pour some hot bits on you or some hot water, you know, and it never happened again. And so how you carry the memory of your ancestors now, your ancestors' words, you know, at that time, your grandmother's words, uh, they didn't have psychologists and, and, um, and, and uh, uh, psychiatrists, and they didn't even have a preacher they could go to with all of this that was happening, but they had each other. And each one of them told the next one how you survive a, a husband, a man beating on you. A, I thought it was just, so I, that, that was a poem dedicated to her, you know? My mother and my grandmother's ashes reside on a acre of land in the suburbs of Bridgetown, Barbados, fertilizing a garden which is dominated by a struggling fringy penny tree which has been besieged by ravenous and predatory caterpillars. Today, in the heat of the sun, I picked them off of the tree one by one. As I did so, I thought about the matriarchs in my family and how it's important to protect traditions. 
My grandmother had the kind of laugh that started conversations. It was a welcoming solve that was punctuated by her natural warmth and wit. Born in Brooklyn of a mother who fled the sugarcane fields of Barbados for Bedford Stuyvesant in 1908, my grandmother would always carry the faint remnants of the Bajan brogue in her mouth and her throat. When sipping rum, what she did too often, she tells stories of the eight Bajan sisters who her mother Ethel brought to America. As a gifted seamstress, Ethel's skilled fingers gave forth to a generation of possibility. In America, the boy sisters all bore girls, except for one boy who everyone affectionately called brother. As a young woman, I heard stories of these sisters. I was told that they started a SUSU, a collective banking system to save money, which was passed to my grandmother and her cousins, and subsequently passed to my mother's generation. This SUSU bought cars, bought houses, paid for weddings, and for me, it paid for a college education. The collective power of these working women is a vital part of my DNA. They forge lives by way of their own ingenuity and self-reliance, a philosophy that is embedded in how I approach my life. I didn't grow up around adults who spent a lot of words on children. They took care of us. And, you know, my grandma, you could tell that uh, it, was, it was clear that feeding a child was a way to make sure they knew they were loved. You know, talking like as a kid, never being inside of a restaurant and then going to grandma and every summer her making sure that we went out somewhere to get something nice. She wasn't a big reader, but always had books in a room waiting for me when I went to visit her. Wish it was some clear, obvious way that I would drop a jewel about the lessons my grandmama taught me. But uh, I think about that uh, most deaf line, blacker than my granddaddy armchair. He never really had much time to chill there because his life was warfare. I feel like my grandmother's from that generation. Folks that came up from the South, had children and worked their damnness to make sure their children were, were good. And then worked their damnness to make sure their grandchildren were good. And so um, the lesson is in the life. You know, hopefully uh, I'll do a better job, really, uh, distilling the things that she gave me without even really trying to, um, you know, to my kids. I was so thankful for people like Barbara Christian and those other b black writers like uh, June Jordan. You know, just the hundreds and hundreds of, of women who have paid the dues, you know, uh, on on both sides, you know, who have eaten and had to take home scraps and crumbs for their children, who were too worn out but did it anyway, bathed their own kids, you know, getting water from a fucking well at pumping it up and heating it where they have left white homes with you know shiny white tile and all kinds of fancy showers and shit and they come home too tired to pre prepare a meal and they do it you know with scraps and with the the poor side of whatever the pig was or the cow or whatever 
you know, and vegetables they grew with their own hands with that little spot of sunshine could be, you know, on a balcony in Harlem or, you know, on, on outside of Gary, Indiana, where they had fields that were idle and black people put in little gardens. We used to have that because my aunt and uncle back especially in the summertime for for those barbecues of of the 4th of July and those those times when you would think you just you can't wait another second until a barbecue was ready but there would be fresh corn and greens and sweet potatoes and uh, just everything some of it from last year's harvest that they had kept in the basements and so on but it would be a big to do baby and we had those kind of things at your grandmother's house whenever we were there it was a big celebration plenty of food and you could never say no to what she had made you know it was like she would come to your bed you know, and get you little pieces of pie and shit to eat, you know, before you slept. I mean, it, the the O'Neill's house was deep, honey. It was deep and it was wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Petit, ou c'est un naturel divino. In Haitian Creole, it translates to, Child, you are a natural witch. Those are the words my mother shared with me, along with the story of how my grandmother saved my life using voodoo when I was a newborn. Although I wasn't close to either of my grandmothers, I understood very early that they were the shoulders I stood on as a recipient of so much magic. The question was, how would it manifest in me? It took me years to fully hear their voices, but once I did, the message was clear. Your power lives in your hands. And it is this truth that carried me through some of the most difficult times in my life including the current pandemic. With the darkness came an opportunity for me to dig even deeper, to see the light of my spirit. And there I found a treasure, a symphony of voices that told me, it is time. From this, I know they mean, I should not be afraid of the next level the place where my greatest magic is yet to be seen. Through this work, I heal, I love, I pray, I see, I give life. Petit, ou c'est un naturel divino. I remember some words she said in a prayer. She said, Lord, I'm so glad you knocked on my door and I opened and let you come in. I wouldn't call us witches, but I'm from slave revolt people. Send Massa back to his crib and suffer the next 200 years in global prison for it, people. I heard somewhere Haiti's 95% Catholic, 100% Vodun. I haven't really been to church in a minute, but my mother's mother was best friends with Jesus. At 94, when she passed, I claimed from her effects a piece of wood that she collected while in Jerusalem in pen 
her unmistakable script. She's written on one side, j'ai vu le sepulcre du cri vivant. On the other side, the date, the 21st juillet, 1984. In 1984, back in the States, Reagan, voodoo, economics, Gomez wasn't with that shit. J'ai vu, I saw the living Christ, Jésus-Christ vivant. In the actual 1984, Gomez wasn't reading Orwell. She was doing something she believed to be holy. In my hand, I hold a talisman of belief. What do my people believe to be true? 45 lies, I cry no tears. I'm Marie Del Toro's grandkid. I no fool. I'm born here because my parents' folks was running from death squads, muted speech, and no option to vote. J'ai vu, she wrote, like a taunt. Come on, son, look around. What do you see? What can you put in the palm of a not yet born grandson as a tribute to what you believe? Gomez say, live to come to see your faith made material. Don't be fooled by that old make America voodoo. Stay close to the sight of the magic and believe. Gwendolyn Brooks was um, like a mother to me. And for me, I didn't have a grandmother. So she fulfilled all those roles over the 33 years that we were family. And this was the last poem I've written on her and her relationship to not only me, but the world. The title of the poem is Gwendolyn Brooks, America in the Wintertime. In this moment of orangutans, wolves, and scavengers of high heat redesigning the north and south poles and the wanderings of new tribes and limousines with the confirmation of liars, thieves, and get-over artists in the wilderness of Pennsylvania Avenue, Standing Rock, misspelled executive orders on yellow paper and crooked signatures. Where are the kind language makers among us? At a time of extreme climate damage, deciphering fake news, alternative truths, and me-ism, you saw the 21st century and left us. Not on your own accord or permission. You have fought and fought most of the 20th century, creating an army of poets who learned and loved language and stories catering seas and oceans. Where is the kind green nourishment of kale and wheatgrass? You thought, wrote, and lived poetry. Knew that terror is also language based on denial, firstism, and rich cowards. 
you were honey to us and yes to us. Never ran from black as in bones, Africa, blood, and questioning yesterdays and tomorrows. We never saw you dance, but you had rhythm. You were a warrior before the war, creating earth language, uncommon signs and melodies, and did not sing the songs of career slaves. Keenly aware of Tubman, Douglas, Wells Barnett, and Du Bois, and the oversized consciousness and commitment of never quit people. Religiously taking notes of the bloodlust enemies of kindness, we heard your last words. America, if you see me as your enemy, you have no friends. For Gwendolyn and Brooks. And I use kindness in a poem a couple of times because that's what she taught me. And she would always say, you know, when I first met her, my name was still Don. And at least you say, Don, you know, you got to slow down. I'm <laughs> saying, and just before you jump on somebody, just think a little bit and think about kindness, you know, because kindness defines character. It gives people a photograph into the way you would take your steps. Right? And so I learned from her. And she said, the other thing is listen to people. Listen. My grandmother was a small framed gentlewoman, high cheekbones and a wide smile. She always smelled of ginete and baby powder. She was what most folks would call a lady. She made home wherever she went. That meant her arms were as wide and as big as her smile. She always taught me always have enough to give. She didn't come from means and always a newcomer in new lands. Rural Jamaica to Kingston, Kingston to Chicago, Chicago back to New York, New York back to Kingston. But if you were in her presence at any point along her journey, she welcomed you with outstretched arms and made you feel at home. She always taught me, you always have enough to give. You always have enough to give. One thing that I've learned or recall learning from my grandmother that I think I'm using now is the, the power of the stove. And my grandmother uh, lived in the same zip code that we lived in as did my mother and her sisters. Um, so everybody went over to my grandmother's house every Sunday after church. And my grandmother also cooked for a lot of people in the city. So her stove was nourished many families, let alone just inside our pretty large family itself. And I know that by having all this time at home is what I've uh, always loved to do was cook, but now what I've dove into further was the cooking that my family does, the recipes in my family, and the need to cook those those recipes for my kids and my wife, and and to gather around what it the taste that the taste of growing up in Houston, Texas, that does not reside here in New York City and the need to carry our stories um, and our lives through the things that we digest. And my grandmother probably was one of the best uh, examples because that's what she showed us. And it wasn't like she was cooking, like she wasn't looking around the world for inspiration. She cooked what she cooked. Most famously, she cooked a very famous brisket that I used to love to go home and eat. And one, when I was in college, one Thanksgiving I went home uh, for, and when it came time for dinner, everybody asked my grandmother, we call her granny, said, where's the brisket? She said, oh, I sold the brisket. So sometimes that happens too.
So when I was a little boy growing up in Mississippi, I thought my granny was the thickest uh, grandmama in all of Forest County. Until one day we went to the mall and I saw her make herself so small for a white woman. Um, we came back home and my grandmama shrunk in my estimation. A few days later, I was out in the ditch with my friend Shirley Dern. We were throwing rocks. We threw this rock and bust a window with a semi truck that was bringing chickens down the road. We ran, I ran into the house. Shirley ran across the street into her trailer. White man came to the door, knocked on the door, said he saw a little boy throw a rock and just blew up his window. My granny, who I thought was so small, got big again. I ain't, I don't know what you're talking about. My grandbaby ain't throwing no rock. Yes, ma'am, I saw, no, you didn't. You better get your ass up off my porch, blah, blah, blah. I came up out of that room when that white man walked off that porch. I'm like, granny. Why that white man? I couldn't get a second word, third word out, man. She got that little switch she had by the door. She started tearing me up. That's when I understood that there was complexities to that generation of black women. There was different ways to perform, different ways to stay alive. And I love her so much for showing me that home must always be protected. Waters of Babylon, where we sat down, where we sat down, and where we wept. When we remember Zion, by the waters of Babylon, where we sat down, where we sat down and where we wept when we remember Zion and when we get they carried us away to captivity and then required of us a song but tell me how can we sing our holy songs in a strange land when we get, they carried us to the captivity and then required from us a song. And tell me now, can we sing our holy songs in a strange land? So let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be accepted in thy sight, O oh, Rye. So let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight here right now. distant heartbeats a rhythm I now know to be my first lullaby I still can't imagine its size unseen hands caress my first kicks and stretches my first embrace I still can't measure their strength a cocktail of milk and blood my first meal I still can't fathom the sacrifice from the shelter of her womb to the depths of her soul, my first home. I can never measure this love. curious child and growing up I remember really wanting to figure out how things and people around me worked and one person in particular I could never figure out 
was my maternal grandmother. So I asked people around me, her children in particular, why she was the way she was. And I remember a phrase my mom learned from her grandmother to try to explain her mother to her was, adios rogando y con el mazo dando, which in essence translates to, you keep, you should pray to God, you should keep begging the gods, but at the same time, make sure to keep hammering, to um, in essence, be mindful of the world around you, to keep active of your destiny, in essence. Um, it's a two-sided track. And I remember seeing how my mom really took this to heart. She was always very, very um, conscious of the material world around her, sometimes to the loss of her spiritual self. And I think in my artwork, it's been a struggle to find a balance between both, how to fully be present in the world, how to um, be actively present in my life, but also um, mindful of the spirits, the spiritual realm, beauty and joy. Here I am in my studio trying to find a balance between both. Do we? 